honorable member from Mekona. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we've had to sit in this honorable house today and witness what to my mind was new law after new law after new law. And I say this because whereas we understand that it is well within the purview of the members opposite to choose to do what they wish with respect to a motion of no confidence in our dear Prime Minister, we must never lose sight of the fact that this is the Honorable House, that we have a responsibility to conduct ourselves in a particular way, and, in, and especially, especially knowing full well that our children, our young people are tuned in. And I therefore wish to raise and table my concern for what I have seen unfold here today. But that is not the reason that I have stood. I stand because I heard insinuations coming from members opposite as if to suggest that the Honorable Prime Minister is denying ministers and MPs the resources and the opportunity to fulfill their role as MP or as minister. And I'm compelled to stand and say that this is very far from the truth. I can say that because I have very vivid recollections of our position regarding the NICE program. And in several different ways and in several places we said, it is one thing to create short-term employment, but what are you doing to enhance the employability of the workers when their contracts would have come to an end? And that is why only days ago, we graduated a cohort of students from the hospitality program hosted by Monroe College in the South so that we can enhance the employability of our young people. And not only have we done so for them in the local jurisdiction, but their certification has international comparability, which means that they can also be employed outside of St. Lucia. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I have heard so many attempts from members opposite to hold this administration responsible for what they perceive to be the stop to the laptop program. I will say it again for those who perhaps have not heard it previously or perhaps failed to understand the government's posture with regard to e-education. That to equip students with the artifacts of technology, with laptops, without the accompanying and commensurate programming, there's nothing more than to put a toy in their hands or a tool in their hands for which they cannot maximize the full utility of the machine. What has this Prime Minister done? He has seen to it that he has mobilized the resources, $9 million in total, to do what with? 
not only to provide a particular form with laptops, but to ensure the conversion of many classrooms within schools into smart classrooms so that more children can benefit at the primary and secondary schools. That's why I'm compelled to stand I am compelled to stand here and pledge my support for him because he also understands that to do so needs that policy has to be, or that activity has to be accompanied by a policy which yesterday I'm proud to say, yesterday we passed in the cabinet of this government the ICT education policy in schools. You don't just drop laptops in their hands. And that goes beautifully with the other program which we started two years ago upon assuming office, and that is innovation in the curriculum to introduce ICT-related courses or courses to enhance the digital competency of our students so when indeed they are greeted with a laptop or any other piece of machinery, they have the competency to leverage that machine for the advancement and not simply for recreational purposes. I support this Prime Minister because last summer, a team of persons from my ministry, we were invited to the World Bank upon the prompting of this Prime Minister to discuss not only education, but another issue that's very close to his heart and to our hearts, and that is gender relations, and to address issues of gender-based violence, and show we empower girls, that we address vulnerability in women, and my team from South Wales and Sustainable Development. And you know what? In one week, we were able to discuss with the World Bank the intimate needs of that ministry and to put together a program of activities. And you will hear more about this, but I stand here tonight, because tonight is what I have. I'm not sure about the budget debate yet. Tonight, to say that this Prime Minister has seen it fitting to give the blessing for our ministry to access $20 million so that we can implement the program we discussed with the World Bank last July. That's why I'm standing here. Mr. Speaker, my colleague has said in passing what we inherited with respect to school plans. Let me give you a simple example. The Viewford Comprehensive Secondary School, a school that does very, very well. The alma mater of some people in this very chamber. When I walked that compound, teachers and students alike said to me, Minister, termites fall into our school bags, into our lunch boxes, and into our hair. By the time I got to Castries and had engaged this Prime Minister, he said, Go ahead and do what you need to do for the A-level block where the termites were falling in the hair of children, in the hair of teachers, in their lunch boxes, and in their school bags. And by the way, the termites preceded us, but it was this Prime Minister who gave us the resources to rehabilitate that block. Yes, in Viewfort South, incidentally. But let me say further, that was outside of the 10 million that he gave later on in the year to address similar issues in other schools around the country. You don't have to be a parent. You don't have to be a teacher or have a child in school to feel uncomfortable in the core of your being when you see the condition of the schools that we inherited. But this Prime Minister, Alan Michael Chastney, made it a priority and pumped $10 million in one summer. That's more than this than in five years. Mr. Speaker, I'm compelled to stand to say to all of St. Lucia 
that within weeks of assuming office, when I walked the South Lewis College compound, and I was taken to the building that once housed the hospitality department, my skin crawled. You talk about mold and mildew as if, it's ins as if these are insignificant. You ask your friends in the m medical fraternity what impact inhalation of those kinds of things can have on your health. So Sartre Lewis had had reason to shut it down. While they were there, I met it that way. The building did not deteriorate to that extent between the 6th of June and the following weeks when I visited. And when Principal Saunders said to me, Madam Minister, if we do not address the situation at Sir Arthur Lewis, we are at risk of not reopening in August, September of 2016. We did the responsible thing. We sought to relocate them. And I engaged this same Prime Minister and said, let's put a plan together for Sir Arthur Lewis Community College. I'll tell you what the plan entails. You'll hear more of it during the budget debate. Already in the rollout of the plan, we've been able to rehabilitate at least two buildings. Thanks to this prime minister, extra budgetary outside of the 10 million, outside of the seven or 800 he gave me for Viewfort, and outside of the 15 million he already gives to Sir Arthur, he found 1.5 for us to rehabilitate buildings at Sir Arthur in time for the reopening of schools. That's why I'm standing here to support him. And it goes on, and I can tell you more, and I beg the indulgence of everyone, because we cannot sit here and allow members opposite to give the impression that this Prime Minister does not care about the people of this country. Here is the evidence. And I'm only speaking about my ministry. Everybody else will speak about his or hers in turn. So Arthur Lewis again. When uh, we inherited the Equip project and we felt it necessary to reprioritize Prime Minister says, I want to see a plan that places Sir Arthur Lewis front and center in any restructuring of the education sector. We are in the process, we have engaged CDB, and we are in the process of putting together what casually we already call a program for educational reform review and transformation, the PUT program. You will hear more about that at budget time. That is an additional win opportunity worth at least $15 million for the education sector. That's, you know when you invest in someone's education, what you do for them? You give that person an opportunity. You give their immediate family an opportunity. You give their extended family an opportunity. And you give the generations to come an opportunity. That is why we believe in investing in education led by this honorable prime minister. We talk about village tourism. And I want to applaud this initiative. Because what it does is not only to showcase the, the heritage gems, the local gems in the respective communities who are that are part of that program, but it helps to stimulate the local economy therein and help to create a greater multiplier effect of the money generated earned therein, as happens with Denry, with Grosley, in Soufre, and Emmark to happen in Mikud North, for example. So when you hear people talking about that there seems to be a focus on some other grandiose foreign entities, they forget the conversation very conveniently. They forget the conversation on village tourism. Mr. Speaker, it was that statement that provoked me, you know, that insinuation as if to suggest that somehow we are not being allowed the latitude or the opportunity to take care of our flock and our ministries. Although this has been debated, but because it was raised today, I want to applaud the effort of the Prime Minister 
in mobilizing the resources not only to rehabilitate and rebuild plain facilities in this country, but to see it fitting to put together an accompanying educational program within the entity of the Center of Excellence for Sports so that you can create additional pathways for young sportsmen and women to become professional sports personalities on the international stage so that a Darren Sammy won't be an aberration, a Laverne Spencer won't be a once in a lifetime, a Miss Alfred won't be somebody we hear about every 10 years, that we are creating pathways. So you have the physical infrastructure in sports, but the commensurate programming in schools, so you create diversity in the curriculum so that they have more choice. That is why I support what this Prime Minister is doing with respect to sports. And I must say, I'm obliged to say too, that the sportsmen and women in Miku North are looking forward to a new facility, thanks to this Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, that is why I reject any suggestion that this Prime Minister is trampling on our heritage. Our heritage, that's a very, very large umbrella term. It is who we are, what we do, how we do it, our unique talent, our authenticity, what we have in our landscape, and leveraging all of that. So whether it be through sports, he does it. Whether it's through village tourism, he does it. Whether it is through enhancing the allocation for Creole Heritage Month, he does it. So I take violent objection to any notion that this Prime Minister is trampling on our heritage. I know the others want to speak, Mr. Speaker, but I tell you I could go on all night because there is something unjust about much of what happened today. The intellectual dishonesty that was displayed here today was vomitous. And I'm saying to the people of St. Lucia, you can read, you can write, you understand English, open your ears and your eyes, and open your eyes in particular, that you can see for yourselves the work that we have started to do, and you will see in time more of what is to come. And that is why I stand here and I say that this Prime Minister is leading this flock of builders because we have hope, because we see new opportunity, and we know that we can continue to set St. Lucia on a prosperous path that will benefit all of St. Lucians. Thank you, Mr. Speaker.